So next we talk about destruction processes for ozone in the stratosphere. And there's two categories for this. There is catalyzed destruction of ozone and there is uncatalyzed destruction of ozone in the stratosphere. Catalyzed destruction of ozone, which we'll talk about in the next video or videos, is the primary cause of concern for loss of ozone uh, in the stratosphere and the resulting ozone holes, which are the primary focus of chapter two. But we'll start our discussion of destruction of ozone by talking about the uncatalyzed processes. So what exactly is going on here? Well, we've got two main pathways for uncatalyzed destruction of ozone. The major pathway is a simple photochemical dissociation of ozone. So ozone absorbs a photon of light, generally in the UVB region. Uh, that's where its absorption is the greatest, so less than 320 nanometers, although presumably it could also absorb in the UVC region. And this causes dissociation of the molecule to generate um, an O2 molecule in its excited state and an oxygen atom in its excited state. Now remember, excited states are where there's an electron that's not in the lowest energy orbital. It's in a higher energy orbital. It could be in many different higher energy orbitals, um, giving you many different options for excited states. It's not really specified here. We're simply told it's in an excited state, and that may depend on the particular wavelength of light that is absorbed, which excited states we form. But then what happens with these? So uh, those excited states rapidly relax down to the ground state. Remember the electron can drop back down to the ground state or the lowest energy orbital. And it does so in a couple of different ways. It can give off a photon of light uh, as a way of dissipating that excess energy, or it could dissipate that energy in the form of heat, perhaps by um, a collision with another molecule and release of, of heat in that process to help get down to the ground state for the molecule, which that occurs very, very rapidly, probably on the order of picoseconds or nanoseconds for these uh, for these excited states to return down to the ground state. Now, after, the, after we've reached the ground state, what primarily occurs, if we're talking about destruction of ozone in the mid-stratosphere, what happens is that we formed a single oxygen atom, but the main form of oxygen that's around is molecular oxygen, O2. And so that oxygen atom primarily just bumps into another O2 molecule and reacts to reform ozone. And so we have a destruction process, which is then coupled immediately to a reformation process for ozone. Now, the second pathway, which is a minor pathway, is say that we have a single oxygen atom, perhaps from the major pathway as a product, and rather than reacting, rather than bumping into an O2 molecule to reform ozone, it happened to bump into an ozone molecule. Maybe this is in the mid- uh, ozone layer. So there's every once in a while that single oxygen atom is going to bump into ozone. Well, what could happen is that that oxygen atom could abstract another oxygen atom from ozone to form two molecules of molecular oxygen or O2. This is a very exothermic reaction for sure. And we could calculate the um, heat or the heat of the reaction just using um, heats of formation data. However, even though the reaction is very favorable, the activation barrier for that abstraction is actually quite high. And as a result, this is a slow reaction, it's certainly thermodynamically favored, if you remember back to GEMCHEM 2, but kinetically it's maybe disfavored simply because of the high activation energy barrier. And so it's a slow reaction and thus the minor pathway for destruction of ozone in the stratosphere. Now, if we take this major and minor pathways and we couple them with the formation processes for ozone that we talked about in the last video, and note that they are coupled to each other because, uh, for example, the major pathway, the, one of the products from that is atomic oxygen, which then is directly involved in the reformation of ozone, we get what's known as the Chapman cycle. which highlights, uh, sort of puts in a graphical sense here, the uncatalyzed destruction and formation processes for ozone. So we have the formation of ozone. If we take O2 and dissociate it using UVC light to generate atomic oxygen, 
which then upon reaction with molecular oxygen or O2, we form ozone. We can have the major pathway, which is destruction of ozone by absorption of UVB light to generate O2 and um, atom of oxygen. Or you could have the minor pathway, abstraction of an oxygen atom by another oxygen atom to generate back to molecular oxygen. And all of these feed into each other. So when we talk later about steady state concentrations and steady state analysis, this is the primary example of this where we have essentially a system in equilibrium where we've got both uh, formation processes and destruction processes and the various rates of those reactions uh, eventually reach uh, a steady state or an equilibrium. Now, the one thing I really wanted to highlight in all of this is that both the formation and the destruction processes for ozone are used to filter UVC and UVB light from the atmosphere. So uh, in terms of the average lifetime of an ozone molecule, given that it is dissociated by uh, UVB light, that average lifetime actually depends on where it's located in the stratosphere. So if we're in the mid to the upper stratosphere, we might have an average lifetime for an ozone molecule, maybe half an hour to an hour or so before it's dissociated, uh, primarily by the major pathway. However, down in the lower stratosphere, that lifetime can be on the order of months, simply because the light intensity of uh, the UVB and UVC light has, has been filtered by the ozone and oxygen molecules in the mid and upper stratosphere. And so as the light intensity drops off, since that's directly involved in the major pathway for uh, the destruction of ozone, the average lifetime then of a single ozone molecule increases dramatically. Let's take a little bit of uh, some of this information and start to put it to a little bit of practice. We have to reach back and remind ourselves of some fundamental general chemistry principles again. So we had drawn that reaction where we have photochemical dissociation of ozone and we produce an excited state oxygen molecule and an excited state oxygen atom. And we're asked about calculating the enthalpy of this reaction and up to this point, we, we don't know, we don't have a heat of formation for an excited state or uh, an excited state of an atom or molecule. So we haven't been able, we don't have the data immediately in front of us to be able to just use heat of formation data to calculate the uh, overall enthalpy for this reaction. But we are given several constituent reactions here which we would be able to measure the enthalpy for those individual reactions. So here we have a reaction where you're going simply from an oxygen atom to uh, the excited state of that oxygen atom, and we're told that the enthalpy for that reaction is simply plus 190 kilojoules per mole. And then we have the same process occurring for O2 going to O2 ex excited state, so that's plus 95 kilojoules per mole. And then we have sort of a reaction that uh, it looks maybe more familiar. That's simply all ground state atoms here, maybe a, a thermal just decomposition of O3 to O2 and O, and that's plus 105 kilojoules per mole. And we're asked to use this, these constituent reactions to determine the enthalpy for the above reaction. And when you first look at this, if you don't have any idea how to solve this problem, we have to reach back to general chemistry principles. You can pause the video now if you want to and look at this and think about it for a moment. So after having thought about it for a moment, we can remember that we can use something that's known as Hess's law, which essentially says uh, that you know, we can get the overall enthalpy for a reaction by adding up the enthalpies of constituent reactions or reactions that can sum to the net reaction. So if I take a look at these three reactions here, and I simply added all of them, just like I would add mathematical equations. I would say, well, on the reactant side, I'll have O plus O2 plus O3. And then on the product side, I would have O star, and then I would have also O2 star, 
and also O2 plus O. Now, just like a mathematical equation, anything that appears in the same form on both sides can be canceled. So I noticed that oxygen atom appears on both sides and O2 appears on both sides. So those can be canceled. And that leaves me only with the desired net reaction. So if I add reactions, just like mathematical equations, I also add their enthalpies in the same way. So here, if I simply take 190 plus 95 plus 105 kilojoules per mole, I may not be super good at uh, math in my head, but 95 plus 105, that's 200, plus another 100, that's 390, that's 390. So the overall enthalpy for this reaction Delta H reaction of the desired reaction above is going to be plus 390 kilojoules per mole. Now we're asked, well, what's the maximum wavelength of light that corresponds to this enthalpy value? What's essentially the maximum wavelength of light that I might be able to use to drive this reaction? And that's actually a simple problem that we've done before. Remember that. We had our equation, energy is equal to 119.627 kilojoules nanometers per mole divided by lambda. In this case, I have an energy value. That's my enthalpy. I'm looking for wavelengths. Well, I can simply multiply both sides by lambda, divide both sides by E, and that essentially just rearranges this equation to be lambda over E. In this case, E is my enthalpy, so 390 kilojoules per mole. That cancels the moles, cancels the kilojoules. I'm going to be left with a value in nanometers, which if I take 119.627 and divide it by 390, I come out with 306.7 or just 307 nanometers. And if I look at that, that looks like it sits squarely in the UVB region, UVB region, which I know from the absorption spectrum of ozone is squarely in the region that ozone does absorb. So this uh, radiating or um, shining UVB light or simply ozone in the atmosphere absorbing UVB light uh, of 307 nanometers or less will cause and drive this photochemical dissociation that is the major pathway for uncatalyzed ozone destruction in the stratosphere.